Section 2 on system theory is for the biggest part a review of what you have seen in the course signals and systems so I will not go into the details and the pace will be generally high. Refer to the video course signals and systems if necessary. Well, we'll start this section 2 on system theory by this very important result that links the convolution integral and the Laplace transform. Before we go any further, we have to talk about the hypotheses that are underlying the systems that we consider. Well, this hypothesis is that the systems are linear time invariant. This means that, for instance, if the system is subjected to an input x1 of t, and this produces y1 of t, and that if it is subjected to x2 of t, and it produces y2 of t, then, by linearity, if you subject the system to a linear combination of these two signals, so alpha x1 plus beta x2 where alpha and beta are some real constants well then the output will be alpha y1 of t plus beta y2 of t right this is expressing linearity time invariance is very simple to explain in words assuming that the system is at rest if you do the experiment today and you do the same experiment tomorrow well you can expect two times the same result the same response if the system is time invariant well a first main result is the result of the convolution integral if you're given the impulse response of the system h of t so this is the response to a Dirac impulse and you're given the input signal to the system then you can compute the output y of t and it is simply the convolution of h of t and x of t and this convolution can be written as follows and this is again under the assumption that the system is linear time invariant. So we've just seen that if you know that the system is described by an impulse response h of t and that you're given an input signal, well, you can obtain the output of the signal as follows. And here, basically, you stay in the time domain. Another way to go is to use the Laplace transform and we'll define the Laplace transform very soon. And what you obtain then is the Laplace transform of the impulse response. And this is the transfer function and the Laplace transform of the input signal, right? X of S and the neat thing about this that is if you go this way well you can very simply obtain the Laplace transform of the output by taking the product of the transfer function with the Laplace transform of the input right since we are interested in the output signal the only thing that you have to do is, of course, compute the inverse Laplace transform to obtain the output signal. Well, a first reason to go through the Laplace transform is that it simplifies very often the computation of the response of the system. A second advantage is that there is a nice frequency domain interpretation assume here that the input signal is the sine of omega t u of t then the response of the system to this input and it's very important that you see that it is the steady state response this means that all transients have disappeared is really h evaluated in j omega and then you take the modulus t 
times the sine plus a phase shift. So what you have here is the argument of h of j evaluated in j omega. So what this says is that the steady state response, the response that you have after all transients have disappeared, is a sign at the same frequency as the input sign, but it is amplified or attenuated, and this is here the module of the transfer function when s is evaluated at j omega, and it is also shifted. So there is a phase shift. And this phase shift is the argument of h of s when s is replaced by j omega. And this leads to the concept of a body diagram that we'll review later. Using the definition of the one-sided Laplace transform, you can construct a library of Laplace transforms just as we did in the course of signals and systems. We're going to use this table extensively, so if necessary, review the course and see how you can re-obtain this library of Laplace transforms. I will just review the three most important Laplace transforms, the Laplace transform of a Dirac impulse, which is one without restrictions on the region of conversion. So the region of conversion is the whole S-plane. The Laplace transform of the unit step, which is one over S, and the region of conversion is the open right half S-plane. So everything that is to the right of the pole at the origin and then finally the Laplace transform of the real exponential that is given over here and this Laplace transform is given over here this is a very important one because a first order system will have an impulse response that is equal to this quantity over here and this will be the transfer function of a first order system with time constant t and gain k we'll come back to that later well we have seen that the output or the laplace transform of the output is h of s times x of s so the transfer function h of s is the ratio of the Laplace transform of the output over the Laplace transform of the input, right? So very often I will now use the acronym P of s to tell you that it is the process that we are considering for control. In the previous slides and in previous courses I have insisted on h of s to tell you that it is the Laplace transform of the impulse response. Well, this transfer function transfers the Laplace transform to the, of the input to the Laplace transform of the output. Well, the transfer function really characterizes the system by means of its poles and zeros, and it is therefore a very important tool for analysis and synthesis and you'll see that in the next section that is dedicated to process behavior well two responses of course that will play a very important role are the impulse response of the system so this is the response to a dirac impulse given zero initial conditions that is when the system is relaxed and what you recognize over here is the impulse response of a first order system and another response that is of course very important in this course is the step response that is the response to a unit step again given initial conditions that are zero so assuming that the system is relaxed and what you recognize over here is the step response of a first order system again 
We've just considered the step response. In the next section, we'll consider the step responses of dynamic systems. A dynamic system is a system for which the output at time t depends on the input at time t, but also on the input before time t. Such a system has memory. When it is subjected to a step-like input, well, such a system will go through a transient phase and finally the output will settle out. This will be very different for a static system because the output at time t only depends on the input at time t. It reacts immediately, it does not have memory. So if you look at the step response and more in particular, if you look the transient of the step response, you can learn a lot about the dynamic system. The step response is kind of the signature of the system. So let us look at a few step responses. So this is here the input. And as we've shown before, for instance, the first order step response will look like this right so it takes some time before the output settles but this is clearly the characteristic of a first order system for instance the step response of a second order system will look very different you can see here that the slope at the start is different. Here you have a slope and here the slope is zero. Step responses might look very different. Okay, so this is here the step response of a lead lag system. Okay, so you can see here that by looking at the step response, we can learn quite a lot about the dynamics of the system and this is what we're going to explore in the next section. It is very important to realize that a rational function in S, so for example here in this case 1 over S, can either be the transform of a signal or a transfer function. Okay, well if 1 over S is a Laplace transform of a signal, this means that x s is 1 over s, so that the original signal in the time domain is x of t is in step signal, a unit step signal. Well, 1 over s can also be the transfer function of the process, and in this case, h s, h of s is 1 over s and this process is an integrating process why because h of t the impulse response is a unit step so you put an impulse at the input and you have a unit step at the output okay so the unit step is the integral of the impulse the Dirac impulse so indeed this process as integrating characteristics. What we can do is combine both and before we do that we can have a look at a system that has integrating characteristics and it's the relation from this control valve over here that will influence the input flow over here to the level in the tank. If at the input you put an impulse, a Dirac impulse, right? What you will see at the output, so this is time here and this is the level, well you will see that the output will evolve as a unit step. You open the control valve for a very short period, what will happen is that the level will increase. So what we are doing over here is really saying, well, y of s 
is hs x of s in this case x of s is equal to 1 and h of s is equal to 1 over s so we have here 1 over s which means that if you do the inverse laplace transform you have that y of t is u of t now what we can do is combine things right and what we'll do is put at the input a unit step right so now x of s will be 1 over s the transfer function is still the same and what we'll have is y of s is h of s x of s so in this case this will be 1 over s squared right and if you take the inverse laplace transform you'll have that the output in this case the level will be t u of t so what we'll have is a response now that will look like this So you'll have a level which is going to increase, which is normal because we'll have a constant input flow into the tank, which will result in a level that increases linearly. So you can see here that 1 over S can be the Laplace transform of a step input, or it can be the transfer function of a process, in this case, an integrating process. The stability of a causal system, and we'll always consider causal systems, depends on the location of the poles. And if the poles are all strictly in the left half S plane, well, the process is stable. So let us look at the S plane. So this is the real part of S and the imaginary part of S. So a system with poles that are all to the left of the imaginary axis corresponds to a process that is stable right so what could happen is that you have a process p of s with poles that are to the left but that you have for instance one pole at the origin right or a pair of complex conjugate poles right and this type of system and here again this is the laplace plane so you have imaginary part of s well, such a system is called marginally stable. Let us take an example that you know. Well, for instance, if P of S is this integrating system that we have considered previously, well, here we have one simple pole at the origin. Well, that system is marginally stable. As you can see, if you take the inverse Laplace transform, well, the impulse response that is associated is a step okay so this is not converging to zero and it's not diverging so this system is at the limit of stability or it is marginally stable if you have several poles at the origin or multiple complex conjugate poles or poles in the right half plane then the system is unstable well what we'll use very often is the initial value theorem and then afterwards also the final value theorem and the idea is that you can establish the initial value of y of t this is the well, value of y of t in the neighborhood of zero using the Laplace transform of y of t. So the assumptions are as follows. y of t and its derivatives have Laplace transforms and then you can obtain the initial value 
of y of t or the value of y of t in the vicinity of zero as follows so you take the limit when s is tending to infinity of s y of s remember of course that when you take the limit here when t tends to zero as you have a one over x relation between time and frequency this will correspond to in the frequency domain to an s that tends to infinity it is possible to do something very similar to establish the steady state value of y of t when t tends to infinity so that's the value of y of t when all the transients have disappeared for this you have to use the final value theorem but this final value theorem and this is why i'm underlying this comes with an assumption and this assumption is that the poles of s y of s are to the left of the j omega axis if this is the case you can use the final value theorem to obtain the steady state value of y of t and you can obtain it by considering this limit when s tends to zero of s y of s you can see here again that this relation in one of x between time and frequency is used here t tends to infinity and here s tends to zero so make sure that you apply this final value theorem correctly because for instance if you apply it to an unstable process to for instance determine the step response you will draw the wrong conclusions the initial and final value theorems will be used quite extensively in the next section on process behavior what we'll do is use it for a given process p of s and this process will be subjected to an input x of s in practice we'll consider only two inputs an impulse the arc impulse and a step input signal so that x of s is either one this is the Laplace transform of an impulse or 1 over s and this is the Laplace transform of a unit step. We are interested in what happens at the origin. So we would like to have y at the origin, but we're also interested in the slope. Okay, so the derivative of y evaluated in t is equal to 0. We're also interested in the steady state response, right? So we can apply the initial value theorem to have an idea of the response at the origin, right? This is simply applying the initial value theorem and replace y of s by ps times xs and this is how you obtain this expression over here you have something very similar of course for the steady state value this is really a straightforward application of the final value theorem what is maybe a bit new is that you can also obtain information about the derivative of y at the origin because this is here simply the Laplace transform of the derivative of y with respect to time right so if you apply the initial value theorem well this is what you obtain and you see here that it involves the output at the origin that you've just computed also with the initial value theorem if you now specialize these formulas to xs is equal to 1 the Laplace transform of an impulse this is what you obtain as you can see x of s has been replaced by 1 if you now specialize the formula to x of s is equal to 1 over s and this is the Laplace transform of the input step signal this is what you obtain 
you can see that x of s has been replaced by 1 over s and this allows us to obtain information about the step response of this system p of s at the origin and in steady state before we start talking about the body diagram i would like to recycle a slide that's coming from the course signals and system if a system h of s this is the transfer function is subjected to a sinusoidal input of this type then you can compute the steady state response and here the word steady state is really important so this means that all transients have disappeared the hidden assumption here is that this system is stable otherwise the transients would not disappear well this steady state response is a sinusoid at the same frequency and this is coming from the fact that the system is linear right and you can see that this output sinusoid in steady state is amplified or attenuated and that there is a phase shift right so this linear system acts as a frequency filter if you vary the frequency omega from zero to infinity well we obtain a whole lot of these responses okay that might be amplified and attenuated and phase shifted differently according to omega and this is what is going to be represented graphically in the Bode diagram so the magnitude plot on the top part of the body diagram is really the transfer function evaluated at s is equal to j omega so it's considering the transfer function on the j omega axis and then you subsequently take the modulus right and the phase shift is obtained by taking this same quantity and taking the argument of this complex number the Bode plot named after Hendrik Bode has two parts the top part is the Bode magnitude plot and well it is related to the magnitude or modulus of h of j omega right and usually it is magnitude expressed in decibels versus the log frequency right to obtain decibels you have to use the 20 log rule and here it's the base 10 logarithm that is used the bottom part is the body phase plot right and it is related to the argument of h of j omega right and here the phase shift is plotted against the log frequency and what is nice is that if you have a very complicated p of s you can kind of decompose it in simpler components p1 to pn and if you're able to draw the body diagrams of the individual components then you simply have to add up the phase shift adds up and since we're working here with a magnitude in decibels well multiplying here will become a matter of adding distances in decibels and this is because of this relation that is valid for the logarithm and also for the logarithm of course in base 10 well let us take an example we can consider the first body diagram here in blue and this process let's call it p1s is that of a pure delay e to the minus theta s here and theta is equal here to zero 
0.05 right we'll see later that at the frequency 1 over theta right and this corresponds to 20 radians per second the phase shift will be one radiant right and one radiant is around 57 degrees you can see that in the magnitude body plot of course we have zero db at all frequencies of course a delay is not changing the magnitude okay it has only an influence on the phase shift if this is a surprise this is not a problem we'll review this later in green you should really recognize the body diagram of a first order system right and this first order system has a cutoff frequency that is well one radian per second so one over the time constant is one radian per second so this will be a first order system here with a gain of one right because in the low frequencies you have a static gain of one so we'll have here one over s plus one right you can see here in the high frequencies the slope at minus 20 dBs per decade here at the cutoff frequency an attenuation of minus 3 dBs and in the high frequencies a phase shift of around minus 90 degrees again if this is a problem we'll review this in orange you have a third system and this is also a first order system you can see it slope here but the cutoff frequency here is 0.1 radians per second so the time constant here is 10 seconds so this is 1 over 10 s plus 1 and then you can kind of imagine what the body diagram is of the system here in magenta right well the body diagram of the system in magenta is p of s and this will be the product p1 p2 p3 and this is really a so-called van der Grinten system and you can see here that it body diagram can be obtained by adding distances at all frequencies in the magnitude body plot and you can do something similar with the phase shifts in the well phase shift body diagram we'll now study the concept of phase and gain margin and what you should do to obtain the phase and gain margins at least if you're doing it in the body plot well you should look at the body plot of the correct quantity and the correct quantity is well the loop gain p times c why is this well we have seen when we have considered closed loop transfer functions that the transfer functions from all the inputs to outputs involved well a numerator and this one is changing but at the denominator you always have one plus pc right and what we are doing when we are looking at the phase and gain margins is looking how far the loop gain pc is from the point minus one minus one is the critical point right and this critical point minus one is characterized by a gain of one zero db and a phase shift of minus 180 degrees well we can now have a look at the phase margin and to obtain the phase margin well you have to isolate the frequency where the loop gain as unit gain so where the loop gain is 0 db and this is at this frequency here 
omega c and this is called the gain crossover frequency or simply the crossover frequency if we now look at the phase shift at this frequency omega c well this phase shift should be higher than minus 180 degrees there should be some margin over here and here this is the case we can lower the phase curve and this will still be okay until we reach this point over here so here we can see that there is a phase margin and this phase margin really is 180 degrees plus the phase shift that you have at this crossover frequency so it's 180 degrees plus the argument expressed here in degrees at the frequency omega c well in order to obtain the gain margin you have to look for the frequency where the phase shift is minus 180 degrees so this is this frequency over here and this is called the ultimate frequency at this ultimate frequency the loop gain should be of course smaller than one so the loop gain in db should be negative right and here this is clearly the case and here we have some gain margin you can still lift up the loop gain so increase the gain before you reach instability and here this gain margin in db right well it's approximately let's say 27 db right so sometimes you just say gain margin in db you write it like this or you're sometimes interested in the gain margin in absolute units but you know that the gain margin in db and the one in absolute units is linked by this equation and this allows you to obtain the gain margin in absolute units so in summary you have to look at the loop gain this is very important i uh, see sometimes students that consider p of s or c of s no it is the loop gain then you have to look at the frequency omega c where the loop gain is 1 or 0 db this is called the gain crossover frequency and you have to look for the ultimate frequency the frequency at which the phase shift is minus 180 degrees this is sometimes called though so the phase crossover frequency well the phase margin is 180 degrees plus the phase shift that you have at the crossover frequency indicative values are in between 30 degrees and 60 degrees the more phase margin that you have the more robust that you are to phase changes in the control loop and of course a phase change can be caused for instance by a delay in the system the gain margin is 1 over the loop gain at the ultimate frequency or the phase crossover frequency if you multiply the loop gain by this gain margin at the ultimate frequency you'll have a loop gain of 1 so you'll be at the limit of stability so if you take something that is higher than this gain margin you'll go to instability indicative values for the gain margin in absolute units well is the range 1.75 and if you use the gain margin in db well you should use the range 5 to 14 db this is of course indicative remember that the link between the gain margin in absolute units this is log 10 of course and the gain margin in db is given by this relation 
but of course you can turn this formula around to obtain the gain margin in absolute units and this is then 10 to the power gain margin in db divided by 20. the gain margin is robustness to gain changes in the loop in the control loop and gain changes come could come from the fact that maybe the process is non-linear and around another working point the gain is different after sampling we have to work with discrete time signals so the system is now described by its impulse response h of k a discrete time sequence and k here is an integer similarly the input signal is x of k we can now compute the response of the system described by this impulse response subjected to the input signal x of k and that's y of k and again it is the convolution of the impulse response and the input signal but here now this convolution is a convolution sum that is defined as follows so we have a first method to compute the output signal well what you could do is go to this other domain and this other domain is now the z domain and the z transform will be presented just afterwards but the z transform is the laplace transform of a sampled signal so the z transform of the impulse response results in the transfer function in the z domain h of z and the z transform of the input signal is x of z well the neat thing about convolution in the z domain is that it's just multiplication so the z transform of the output signal can be obtained by multiplying the transfer function with the z transform of the input signal right and now to compute y of k it's just a matter of taking the inverse z transform remember that a signal f of t can be sampled by multiplying it with the dirac comb and if you do this well you obtain the sampled signal and this sampled signal is given over here so if we take the laplace transform of this sampled signal right this is what you obtain by linearity you have to take a sum of the function evaluated at the sampling instance times the laplace transform of this delta here and it's a family of shifted deltas and by the laplace transform of a delta which is one and the time shifting property you can rewrite it like this right and now it's just a matter of notation it's a sum and we'll write it like that and then we'll define the z variable and this will lead to the z transform this one you can rewrite as e tss minus k right and this is z right so this is the sum on k f of k z minus k and this is the definition of the z transform but you can see that it's simply the laplace transform of a sampled signal here you have the definition of the one-sided z transform it is a transform for causal signals or for signals that have been made causal by multiplication with the unit step so in the previous slide we had found this expression here and here k ranges from zero to infinity since we're working with a causal signal of course there is also associated to this a region of convergence 
using this definition of the z transform you can construct a table of z transforms i'm not going to insist in this course because will not work with the z transform that often i can hear that some of you are happy but if you insist well you can go and have a look at the course of signals and systems that is available online we'll just need a little reminder of the time shifting property but in the case with zero initial conditions right so if the z transform of the sequence f of k is f of z well then the z transform of this time shifted sequence is z minus k0 f of z so for instance if you have a system with transfer function z minus one right and you compute the response to an input signal x of k with associated z transform x of z well the response is simply as we have seen h of z x of z in this case h of z is z minus one x of z so if you take the inverse z transform this is what you obtain so you can see here that z minus one is really the unit delay operator 